if you lined up a group of 100 men, one in 15 of those would have a fertility problem. So it's really common. But guys don't necessarily know that until they get to the point of trying to have a family. Or couples don't even know that when they, until they get to the point of, of, of struggling to have a family. Science. Science. Technology. Technology. Medicine. Medicine. Health. Health. These four things make the world go round. Without them, we couldn't exist. This is the Monday Science Podcast, a weekly show bringing you the latest research and news in science, technology, medicine, and health, answering your questions or finding experts in the field to answer them. Your host is a pharmacist, an award-winning scientist. She leads her own research group and is the founder of King's College London Fight the Fakes, a tad bit on the qualified side. Welcome to Monday Science. Here's your host, Dr. Bahija Rimey Abraham. On today's episode, we have Dr. Sarah Martins de Silva. Hello, Sarah. How are you? Hi, I'm good. Thank you very much. Good. Um, very excited to have you on. I was actually just saying that, so I'm repeating myself, but repeating myself for people to hear. We're going to be talking today about male fertility and male infertility. Um, so let's start off with, please just tell us a little bit about you. So, well, I'm a gynecologist, so I'm a, I'm a doctor, I'm a fertility specialist, but I also work in research. And my real focus of, of research is trying to understand male fertility, but more particularly how sperm work, why sperm don't work and why some guys have fertility issues and just sort of then ultimately trying to discover new treatments for for men for fertility but also as a sort of spin and alongside that also male contraceptives very interesting today's conversation has been uh, it's going to be a long time coming because we've had requests from our listeners to talk about male fertility and male infertility and as you know we've got some listener questions as well that we're going to get uh, stuck into later on how did you get into this area of research oh great question like most things in life I guess you sort of slightly stumble and slightly have a have a, a thought for, through path of a kind of a career but essentially I from when I was really really young I always knew I wanted to be a doctor I didn't know what sort of doctor I wanted to be but you know from as long as I can remember I've always wanted to be a doctor and it's kind of strange because no one in my family is medical it's just you know I was really intrigued by science really interested by that and kind of followed that passion and fortunately my skill set was such that I was strong at science at school went to Edinburgh University to study medicine and during my time as a medical student was involved with delivering babies and seeing kind of gynecological things and fertility clinics and thought wow I, I you know really sort of struck me into my attention so at that point I thought I know this is the type of doctor I want to be from there I have had quite a circuitous kind of career and I I don't know to cut a long story short I ended up kind of in the later stages of my clinical training almost at the point of becoming a consultant moved to Dundee and Dundee is a real hot spot for a male infertility and sperm research got involved with that and realized I guess because of the infertility couples that I was seeing in clinic that the reality is is that we don't understand sperm and there aren't treatments for men apart from IVF type treatments, which involves obviously basically treating the woman for the man's male head of health problem. And just, you know, realising there was this huge lack of knowledge and lack of understanding and lack of clinical treatments. And then as, you know, kind of, we all go, you know, why? Why is that? Why, do, why don't we understand that? And just sort of got more and more in, involved in it. And that's how in the last decade, my kind of career has progressed. That's um, That's amazing. Amazing. And is there, because you said Dundee, so Dundee, is it the university or that area that, that is known specifically for inf male infertility and fertility? Yeah, no, I mean, all of the universities across Scotland are, I would say, strong in reproduction research. I, I have a background of research at Edinburgh University as part of my medical training, but more focused around eggs. But I think Dundee is one of the few centres that, you know, the, the, the university there is very strongly affiliated with the IVF clinic and so on. And there's a, a real um, kind of synergy of effort there between the clinical delivery of care but also the sort of the research and the understanding so yeah it was fortuitous to be in that particular place and that's probably what's made me who I am today. Amazing and so we've been saying well I've been saying male fertility and male infertility and what is the actual term that's best to say so do we just say fertility and what 
is it. <laughs> so, yeah. So the clinical diagnosis is infertility. infertility. That's sort of the medical word to use. And that really describes a situation where a couple have been trying to have a baby for 12 months or longer and not succeeded in getting pregnant naturally with regular intercourse. Very few couples are completely sterile, but clearly if you have a guy that has no sperm at all, then the possibilities of them getting them pregnant themselves naturally is, is, is you know, almost non-existent. Uh, similarly, if you've got somebody who's run out of eggs in their ovary for whatever reason, and they won't get pregnant but generally speaking that kind of term is infertility and that covers that spectrum of, of, of clinical diagnosis okay so we should be saying male infertility i don't know if you i don't know i was gonna say i don't know if you watch netflix i'm sure you watch something but there was no no i can imagine you're probably super busy but i think there was a documentary about fertility and there was a documentary about male there was a documentary overall about fertility and then they had a few sections focused on sperm and male infertility and you know trying to create awareness and there was something when you said that you know people who men who may not have sperm at all you know and 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 sort of that impact what how common is male infertility actually because you highlighted as well that there's a lot of focus at times on women and you know the the awareness that okay a woman can be infertile and but I'm not to say a men, men can't be infertile but you know there is seems to be a lot more sort of focus on women infertility so how common is it and just yeah just tell us a little bit more so you know without being too binary you know generally speaking what I deal with is a man and a woman in front of me in clinic and so you need an egg and a sperm to make a baby probably about one in seven couples heterosexual couples trying to achieve a pregnancy have a problem difficulty conceiving have infertility now within that probably that half relates to the male side of that partnership about a third the female you know sort of unexplained in betweens but so from in terms of you know if you lined up a group of 100 men one in 15 of those would have a fertility problem so it's really common but guys don't necessarily know that until they get to the point of trying to have a family or couples don't even know that when they until they get to the point of, of, of struggling to have a family. So one in 50 men have a fertility issue. And out of those men, about one in a hundred of them will have no. Wow. What's that? What's the term for that? Sorry, the medical term for no sperm. Yeah. So. And then there's all sorts of other sort of medical jargon, the descriptive scientific language that goes along. So a low sperm count is also known as oligozoospermia. Poor sperm swimming is thenozoospermia. But I'm not sure. I think those terms are particularly helpful. I think it's probably yeah. easier to talk about people having low sperm count or poor sperm swimming. Yes. And so because when I'm, I'm blown away because when you break down the statistics, it's actually a bit of a reality check. Because when I was putting together and asking people questions for this, and I also asked some of my male friends there was a general assumption that infertility is more of a, a female problem and it's not really something that they need to worry about and I don't know and I, I apologies if this comes across, sounds very crude but I don't know whether because if a man ejaculates in the semen then there's an assumption that within the semen right I mean I think it's spot on right I think you know this is a real real challenge I think you know whereas you know without again generalizing or whatever but you know we ladies we sort of you know you get a period each month you know whether you're ovulating and lots of people are kind of kind of in tune with their physiology with their reproduction just because of the makeup of, of who we are and how it works whereas as you say guys you can ejaculate you know m- most of an ejaculate is prostatic secretions seminal fluid and so on it's not the sperm and so you you're right if you're sexually active if you're having a healthy sex life if you're ejaculating normally why on earth would you think that there's an issue there yeah and in terms of diagnosis and you, you have touched on this briefly do you in your practice do you is there oh sorry it's this is blowing my mind in a way do you end up having to diagnose because somebody has come in and identified that there could be an issue as opposed to a routine screening you know is it because I I think it's a case of even even with people who are trying to conceive you don't really think about I mean we have a whole separate conversation about contraceptives and how you are sort of quote unquote not told but you know you take contraceptives ah don't get pregnant don't get pregnant and then the moment you want to get pregnant you're like ah I can't get pregnant you know that's how it is so is that how it tends to happen for you where patients come and say oh I've been trying I need to check myself out or or 
is is there even a small minority that have routine fertility? So I think it's fair to say that there are no routine fertility checks, certainly within the UK and certainly within the NHS. So, you know, you're right in terms of the people that would come to have a sperm test, the guys that would come for a sperm test would likely be from a couple where they've been trying to get pregnant and it hasn't worked. The way that that generally works is that either the the, the male guy partner or, or, the, or the, the couple would get in touch usually with their general practitioner, a GP, and say, I've been having an issue getting pregnant and that would then trigger some tests and investigations and certainly within the kind of clinical environment that I work sort of Dundee and surroundings we would anticipate that couples that come to clinic will have had from the female side some degree of of, of blood tests whatever to check ovulation and releasing an egg each month and from the male side of things to have had a sperm count or semen analysis done but I know that there are a lot of stories and reports of people who've really struggled to have their male partner even investigated so you know bring on this you know kind of fertility check the difficulty though I would say is the current kind of levels that we look for in a sperm count look for in terms of the percentage of sperm that are swimming well we call that progressive motility these are just population cutoffs they don't tell you that a man is fertile or infertile they just tell you the probability of getting pregnant is greater or lesser so if you've got a sperm count that's less than 16 million per mil if you've got less than 30 percent of sperm that are swimming meaningfully or progressively then you're more likely to have a fertility problem but there are many couples that will conceive where the guy's sperm count is poorer than that so it's not an absolute unless there's no sperm then there is always a possibility that a couple could get pregnant and so I guess the worry about doing some sort of screening test is that you find that somebody's got a lower sperm count that them might be statistically ideal to get pregnant but actually you don't know whether they have a fertility problem or not and you know I guess there is increasingly a market for you know home fertility tests and so on for guys because I think people are curious and people want to potentially know without having to either have tried for a year and failed to get pregnant or or or, you know, want to know for information's sake and, and trying to sort of find some sort of empowerment themselves rather than kind of just, you know, asking a, a doctor for, for a test or investigation rather than being able to do something themselves. So my point of reference with this next question, and I'd say for is not to make it too sort of binary, but whereas with women we know that their conditions such as endometriosis polycystic ovary syndrome and even fibroids and things like that that can cause fertility related issues are there male specific conditions that can cause infertility you know dare I say it like a male equivalent of endometriosis you know are these are these things we still don't fully understand yeah I mean I think absolutely and I think the difficulty is that when we have a conversation like this there's a lot of I don't knows in the in when we talk about male fertility when we're talking about sperm production and so on we don't really understand it very well we know the basic building blocks so you need hormones to be produced there's a little gland at the base of the brain called the pituitary and it produces two hormones that then signal to the testicles to produce testosterone, which is obviously a male dominant hormone, but also then to build sperm. So if you don't have enough testosterone, then your sperm building power of your testicles is reduced. And so one thing that guys may be aware of if they have specific medical conditions that suppress their testosterone levels is that they may notice differences. And we call, you know, things like your beard and your facial hair growth is less productive so that you maybe need to shave less often maybe you don't need to shave at all another thing that's exquisitely sensitive to testosterone levels is early morning erection so you know we all kind of talk about morning glory or whatever and actually you know that is a physiological response because your testosterone as a man is highest at the beginning of the day and so if you've got issues with erection first thing in the morning if you wake up and that isn't what's going on or if you are having difficulties with erections per se then these can be signs that your testosterone level is low and that's something that can be treated it's one of the few conditions in the in the male infertility spectrum that actually is treatable over and above that though there's not really very much else that might suggest that you have a male fertility problem and certainly you know different you know medical conditions like cystic fibrosis they're very specific things that might be associated with it but overall the large proportion of men that have a, a you know infertility issue have nothing to suggest in their medical history or in tests or investigations or examination that anything is 
is a mess. Wow. You there was a BBC article which discussed your your work. I'll just get the title. The doctor trying to solve the mystery of male infertility. I'm going to put it in the episode description for our listeners to read. And the article discussed your work trying to solve the mystery of male fertility and you stated that sperm count levels had fallen by 50 to 60 percent in the last four decades as of 2019 and I like there was a quote that you had that I liked which said imagine a world where nobody can get pregnant the population is aging we face extinction extinction of the human race and all because of male infertility I found that line so powerful and very interesting there's a few sentences because also Randomly, at the time, I've been watching The Handmaiden's Tale, which is an interesting narrative, right, about, you know, female fertility. So can you just talk to us a little bit about that article and and just some of these stats that you you stated there and and just, yeah, what that was all about? Yeah, so um, the BBC have every year a programme where they identify 100 women in various walks of life and they name them as their BBC 100 women. So I was one of the 100 women in 2019. That's what that award was about which was a fantastic sort of surprise and and wonderful honour but as part of that I had to do a talk that was then filmed for the BBC World Service and I went for a real provocative opener you know because I think you know if you look around the world particularly with COP and everything that's kind of happened recently you know we I think more people are worried about there's too many of us running around on the planet and all the sort of devastation and and the kind of wake of destruction that we're leaving behind us but actually on an individual level I see couples in front of me that have extraordinary pain and suffering that often is not very easy to talk about because they can't achieve a family. And so this article that was published, we called something meta-analysis. It's basically a scientific process where you look at various studies and you put those studies together to make the numbers bigger, to make the science more powerful. And you have to be quite robust and careful how you put those studies together. The studies have got to be good studies in their own right and the studies have got to have you know similar characteristics. But there was a, a this was kind of based on this study that came out of of Israel where a a group had done this meta-analysis and they looked at various reports of sperm count and as this talk said you know in the last four decades men's sperm count has pretty much halved and it's a straight line going down and it just falls decade by decade. Now we're nowhere near that kind of infertility threshold you know that kind of 16 million per I talked about before we're not close to that but the bottom line is we don't know what's going on there we don't know why sperm counts are falling and we don't know what we can do to ease that stop that change that trajectory and it kind of in in tandem with that you also see increasing rates of, of of men affected by testicular cancer you see increasing rates of abnormalities in male genitalia and babies born and so there's a real kind of thought process within the scientific community that these three things are linked and actually that you know whilst we don't understand what's going on as I say you know the cop kind of kind of reference is not on duly irrelevant here because actually we worry that actually it's something that exposed to you on the planet or pollution or you know is male infertility is it the, you know the most sensitive barometer of the human species feeling the pinch of all of the stuff that we're doing that, that, that we see in terms of other species becoming extinct or, or plant diversity reducing and so on again I think you know there's always a well we don't really know as there is with male infertility and male fertility overall but you know the, the data that's there is very powerful and the data in the past that has suggested that sperm counts are falling has always been criticised because, you know, microscopes are better, we count things more accurately, we've got computers and all these kind of things to help us, you know, is it just that we're analysing things better in the 21st century than we did in the 70s and the 80s? But I think, if I'm honest, I I look at this data and I just don't think you can argue with it. There's there's so many thousands and thousands of results in there that, you know, it's difficult to see that this could be made up or, or, or what the other influences that you just can't break that story. So, you know, that that's the worry is we don't understand sperm. We don't know how they're built. We don't know what's affecting male fertility, but it looks like sperm counts are going down. And if they do get to a point where, you know, reproduction becomes harder and harder and harder, what does our future look like? And some as I say might argue, well, maybe that's a good thing. Maybe that's the planet rebalancing. But on the other hand, I think we need to know 
what's going on. And there's perhaps also a bigger underlying story that we haven't really tapped into too much, but certainly within the sort of general press, which is that we know that men who are seen with infertility problems seem to have poorer, longer term health outcomes, whether that's cardiovascular disease or they're more likely to get cancer or whatever. So sperm production is exquisitely sensitive. We don't really know what's affecting it, but it, you know, it certainly needs to be understood better because there may be, whereas we ladies, we go for our smear tests or, you know, whatever other investigations, guys don't often go to the door of their GP for any sort of check. And if this is one way that we can pick up that there may be some sort of health problems in the future that we can intervene and change lifestyle or change, you know, medical health, then that, that's got to be, a, a, you know, a good thing for everybody, let alone for the couples that are just struggling to conceive. Wow, it's very enlightening talk because I don't really have enough of these public conversations you know about this topic and and really what you were saying like relating it to the wider society I'm blown away like okay you know let's talk about semen I think it, semen is as we, we've put to touch on it early earlier on but I don't think we all know enough about it so what is semen and its composition what what is what is it What's in there? Okay, so most of it is kind of proteins. Fructose is sugar, which is an energy source for sperm, but actually sperm is a really small proportion of the entire ejaculate, as I mentioned. Before. So we talk about semen because we talk about an ejaculate, but actually what we're really, you know, if you're really talking about semen, you're talking about the seminal plasma, which is the, the fluid, the proteins, the enzymes, and so on that, that, that comes out of the body at the same time as a sperm is expelled. Why is that important? Again, don't know but we know that as I say fructose is the main sugar source which is an energy source for sperm. Now sperm are really exquisite cells I'm fascinated by them as you probably can tell from our conversation to date but you know the, the real fundamental differences are that the sperm is a really really streamlined and really really specialized cell and so it has DNA which it needs to get to the egg to fertilize the egg to make the, the baby. It has a huge battery pack that we call a mitochondria and there's not really a lot else in that sperm cell because it's got to swim a mighty mighty long way so it's got a massive tail and a battery to, to propel it to get to where it needs to get to but it doesn't have a lot of other cell content so other cells have cell content we call cytoplasm so this is the filling within the cell and it contains all kinds of machinery to build proteins to read dna sperm doesn't do any of that so sperm have to be quite resourceful in their journey to the egg and so what they need is they energy because they can't really produce much energy for themselves so we think that's what the fructose is, is a big boost and it also can't kind of read dna and manufacture new stuff so it tends to rely on cues or signals from within the the uterus from in the fallopian tube from the egg and the follicle fluid itself i think this kind of maybe leads on to one of the other questions that you kind of thought we might be talking about which is calcium which is this incredible message message within the cell and it tells the sperm what to do so within the sperm set the sperm tail or along the sperm tail in kind of racing stripes four racing stripes down the sperm tail are these little clusters of membrane pores and we call them cat spur channels now cat spur channels they're, they're this very complicated membrane pore structure but they are ultimately responsible for almost all of the calcium coming in and out and the reason that they are important is because when the calcium comes in and it boosts up the calcium levels then it changes the way that the sperm swim it propels the sperm to swim better on the front of the sperm head is a is an element called the acrosome which has some enzyme which is useful for busting into the egg when it gets that far again calcium is the kind of uh, message that tells it what to do and when to do it and so the reason that my research is particularly interested in is because we think that this calcium signal if it's if it's misread or, or, or misaligned in the wrong way for whatever reason but that causes not to work in the right way and so that might be one of the reasons why sperm don't swim well why sperm don't fertilize eggs etc etc and maybe one of the reasons why men have a fertility we just had uh, two episodes run with uh, somebody from the london metalomics facility so where we're looking at so i mean i i've been interested in their work for more infections and looking at the influence of different metallic nanoparticles going in and out of bacteria and parasites to see if we can get insight into the organism's behavior. But I'm, I don't know if you've thought of this, but, you know, doing a sort of metalomic analysis and understanding the calcium concentration 
or trace element concentration in sperm of quote unquote healthy sperm, quote unquote infertile sperm from somebody who might have low fertility could be quite interesting. I don't know if that's something that would give insight or is that what you're doing already? Have you already? Well, interestingly, there have been a couple of studies looking at the metabolome of the seminal plasma. And for whatever kind of ions and uh, other metabolites that have been studied to date, they haven't been able to make that magical alignment of this is high or this is low, and this means they're less likely to be fertile. So, but the interesting thing here is that it's much more dynamic than just looking at the male sperm or just looking at the male seminal plasma. Actually, the sperm swim out of the seminal plasma once they get past the cervix anyway. But actually, it's then what do they pick up? How do they interact with the the environment? So the lining of the womb is called the endometrium. How do the sperm interact there? We think they dock and undock and dock and undock repetitively to get up the fallopian tube. How do they know which tube to go to? How do they know how to get to the... These are questions we genuinely don't know the answer to. And so there's so much there that you could could think of and, and, and look at. But this Catsburg channel, I think, is part of a, a key to unlocking that understanding. If you put sperm in front of, for example, the hormone progesterone, there's a lot of progesterone that comes from the egg and the follicular fluid that the egg is bathed in before it ovulates. If you put a sperm in front of this progesterone hormone, you see this massive spike in calcium within the cell. So it responds to what it sees. It's very difficult to build those sort of models in a lab, in a, in a scientific environment. But we we often ask patients who are having IVF treatment, whatever the, you know, after they've had the treatment, that's the most important part, but if there's leftover sperm cells, we ask if they would donate those to research. And we add a variety of different chemicals, progesterone, prostaglandin, some other kind of natural hormones that the sperm may be exposed to in the course of, of natural conception. And we look for responses. And we know that about 10% of, of sperm that apparently looks normal down a microscope will have issues with this calcium response, either because of a faulty calcium channels or faulty potassium channels so it's 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 likely to be a reasonably common problem for infertility but it's not something that you can currently diagnose in a a clinical setting though so that's one of the kind of real thrusts of our research is trying to get better diagnostics to understand sperm and be able to diagnose male infertility better but it's a huge there's so much that we genuinely don't I mean so I was just about to say your work is fascinating and and this area is fascinating because I I feel that you know we're in what year are we in 2021 and it almost feels at times like our knowledge is saturated we know so much you know and then to hear that we still actually know very little you know this is off the back of our, our our women's fertility and women's health series and learning that we just know we do not know enough about ourselves to some extent you know and I think you know, I always think it's incredible when I watch these you know the space race things that are going on at the moment and so on you think gosh you know it's absolutely phenomenal that we can get a rocket with people to the moon or the space station and yet we have really no proper clue how a sperm gets to an egg you know it's like one of the most fundamental questions of you know our entire existence and we just don't understand it it's, it's yeah it's a, it's actually quite shocking and one thing I haven't touched on actually is age and the what's the relationship between age male infertility in particular actually age and sperm quality and, and, and semen analysis as well if you have that yeah so I mean like all things as we get older we tend to not be quite so good at reproducing we ladies are it's much much more sensitive and much much more obvious and certainly by the time we get to our late 20s our fertility starts to fall by the time we get to our mid 30s that fall goes quicker by the time we get past 40 that fall is really really plummeting and you know your kind of fertility is likely to be sort of finite by your sort of early to mid 40s now if you kind of run a, a cohort of men of the same age and look at their fertility what you'll find is that there is a gradual and a gentle decline which just starts from you know late 20s onwards but there's not really the same kind of cliff if that's the right way to put it at any <laughs> specific enough. you've got guys that are like 60 70 their sperm is not as good their sperm count is not as great their sperm dna damage is probably higher compared to somebody that's in their 20s or their 30s but there's not a specific age that you can say that's the point where things don't go well. The other interesting dynamic, I guess, when I'm treating couples in a clinic is that within reason, most couples need, seem to be very similar in age. 
So, you know, give them sort of four or five years either side of, 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 say, the female age. So generally speaking, older women are with slightly older men. And there is what the problem is, because our women's age is such a dominant force in terms of egg quality and in terms of fertility prognosis and so on, whether you're having IVF or whether you're trying to get pregnant yourselves. But actually an older guy, you know, within reason, if he's paired with a younger woman with younger eggs, the egg can do quite a lot of repair and, and, and compensation. Whereas couples that are both older, they their prognosis is poorer. So yes, men get men's sperm count goes down as as they get older. Men's sperm swims less well as they get older, and the DNA, which is this important part of taking that genetic sequence to the egg to pair up to make a new offspring, that of the damage in that accrues over time. So men that are older have higher DNA damage. So if you look then at sort of IVF kind of programs and the likelihood of fertility treatment working as and of itself men's age is is not a not a particularly sensitive prognostic predictor of what, whether somebody's going to get get pregnant whether their treatment's going to work or not whereas the women's age is very much so wow and so based on where you you know your your journey in this area and your research in this area how do you think male infertility will be tackled and addressed in the future and, and are there any treatments on the horizon so i think the first thing to say is that you know one of the real kind of dilemmas that i see in in, in the clinic situation that I work is that infertility as a as a kind of a clinical issue sits under the kind of remit of gynecology and by by definition the specialists including myself are women's health specialists so I think one of the things is that the tone of the clinic effort needs to be much more encompassing of men and women. I think it's very easy for those of us who spend a lot of time in our training before we become consultants and so on in the latter stages of, 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 of you know, kind of our, our working lives. You know, we're so focused on women that it's very easy when we get into a clinical setting where you've got a couple to still remain focused on her more than him. It's not helped by the fact that there aren't really any treatments for him. It's not really helped by anything else. And actually, the one treatment that we do have for male infertility is a version of IVF which we call ICSI, but that involves treating the woman. So again, even though there's a treatment for the couple to achieve a pregnancy, it's all again focused around treating the woman for the man's health problem. So that is one of the, and I guess one of the real kind of focuses of this BBC 100 Women thing was I was sort of shouting out and crying out and saying, you know, this is really unjust. This is not correct. And, you know, we need to challenge this. We, as a profession, we need to challenge it. As scientists, we need to challenge it. As women, we need to challenge it. And we also need to get our men to stand up and challenge it. And so that's the first thing is, you know, that there needs to be a professional sway. And I think that's starting to happen. The second thing is, is there any more treatments in the offing? Well, yeah, I mean, one of the things we haven't talked about a lot, and I kind of just uh, oblige me for a moment, I'll just t- touch on one other topic, which is all to do with oxidative stress. So oxidative stress is this sort of umbrella term for sort of metabolic stress that our cells are exposed to. So every cell in our body in the course of its normal metabolism makes reactive oxygen species. So these are highly energetic molecules. On a, on a good day, they are very helpful to sperm. They help sperm do the things that it needs to do. The problem is when more and more of these highly active molecules build up, they potentially become damaging. And so there's quite a bit of focus because back to your question about seminal fluid and seminal plasma, within the seminal plasma are a lot of naturally occurring antioxidants. So these are molecules that dampen down and absorb those reactive oxygen species. And these are things like vitamin C, vitamin E, selenium, zinc, carotenoids, carotenoids and so on, carnitines. So there's been quite a lot of focus because we know that oxidative stress is a common problem. And the problem is that the oxidative stress damages the cell membrane so they don't swim so well it damages the dna within the sperm cell so that the message is disrupted but it can also kill the cell ultimately and therefore low sperm count the problem is that oxidative stress is a very generic term if you look at somebody having a heart attack they've got oxidative stress if you look at somebody with high blood pressure or with kidney failure they've got oxidative stress so there's been quite a lot of focus in the absence of anything else thinking well can we treat oxidative stress for male infertility can we give guys vitamins can we give them supplements can we give them antioxidants to try and address this problem 
problem. The bottom line is it doesn't look like on big kind of meta-analysis studies, it doesn't look like giving somebody a, a vitamin supplement, vitamin C or, or zinc or whatever is good enough. It might improve your sperm count a little bit, but it might not get you pregnant. But the numbers are so small when you look at couples trying to actually get pregnant, have a baby. So I've been involved in, in trying to tackle this from a completely different direction, which is can we inhibit enzymes that cause oxidative stress to happen and so we've repurposed an astrazeneca molecule at the moment it's got a really catchy not a uh, title called it but it's mm. basically um yeah great but it's basically a, a a drug that's been used to actually treat completely different some sort, some sort of brain disorder i can't quite remember what it was but we actually then added it to sperm in the lab and we found that if you if you have stress sperm you add this drug to it you can make them swim better you can make them perform better you can make them get through mucus which which is obviously what it needs to get through, or you know, as a as a, a journey to. And so, what, what we're now in this phase of doing is waiting for funding to be confirmed. But a pre, so that's sort of preclinical work. We're now moving on to a clinical trial. So give the guys a tablet to take. Can we see some positive effects on their sperm? And whether that might be differences in the seminal plasma, differences in the way that the sperm swim, improvement in DNA damage, they're not so damaged. We don't really know, but that's what we're looking for, and we hope that we'll be able to announce funding and the, and the trial coming soon. And if we, you know, we'll do a sort of proof of concept trial, and if we show some positive work on that, then hopefully then we'll ramp it up as a, as a big kind of randomised trial where guys will either take this active tablet or they'll take a placebo, which is a blank tablet, so that we, we don't know who's getting treated with what, and we can then assess their, their sperm, but also whether they get pregnant. So there is positives there, but at the moment, the, the kind of clinical treatment is all kind of focused around ICSI, a version of IVF called ICSI. And for that reason, I think men still sort of feel quite sidelined in their infertility experience. The other thing then that's happened relatively recently is one of the comedians, Rod Gilbert, might have come across him, but he's basically has stood up and said, I have male infertility and, you know, making as he can, because he's so talented, you know, a joke and a a, you know, very engaging state to to engage other people, to get men talking about infertility, to get men thinking about it, but also to get the public thinking about it. Because I think fertility problems are not easy to speak about. As I say, we ladies, we tend to chat with our girls. I don't think guys do the same kind of thing. And he's just sort of saying, look, let's meet for a virtual pint and just chew it over. And because it's good to talk, you know, and it's really when you're carrying something that is, as I say, stressful, can be really quite damaging and difficult because it involves your other half. You're the person that you're probably closest to it might be upsetting to talk about it with them so actually you know a problem shared is a problem and talking about it but also you know sort of calling it out and saying why is it like this make make something happen make something change and making us as a profession us as a society think about things differently so I think with those sort of professional differences with with scientific endeavor and with you know kind of public support I think we've got a real chance of, of turning the tide on this and, and putting it on the agenda as something that needs more focus and needs more amazing and good luck with your your funding I hope that comes together and and would love to have you come back and, and talk to us a little bit more about the work and and how that study is the clinical trials are progressing you mentioned ICSI I've never heard of this treatment but the, the process before do you mind just explaining what that is and how it works ICSI is really just a version of IVF if you ever see any sort of news program or documentary on tv about IVF they show a picture of an egg being held in place and, and a sperm being physically in injected inside that egg. So that's what ICSI is. It stands for intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So you take a woman through IVF treatment, you stimulate the ovaries to grow a group of eggs. The eggs are collected usually under sedation, a scan guided procedure under sedation. The eggs in the lab, each mature egg is then injected with one sperm to fertilize it. Any embryos that are created are then usually cultured for a number of days and we try and pick the very best one to put back. So whether a couple are having IVF treatment or whether they're having ICSI treatment, what they experience as treatment is exactly the same. The only difference is what we do in the lab because you need pretty normal, pretty good sperm, sperm count, good sperm swimming to do IVF because what we do is prepare the sample, add the sperm to the eggs, put them in the incubator, let them get on and fertilize the eggs. When you've got low sperm count or poor sperm swimming, the, the sperm don't really Really necessarily have enough ability to be able to get through the outer coat of the egg. There's something called the zona pellucida, which is a sort of jelly egg shell. So it needs to get through that as well. So we, we take all those, we don't take the barriers away, but we, we physically put the sperm in the egg to try and fertilize it that way. And, and what's the success rate with that? So IVF and ICSI success rates are both very similar. Overall, I would say it's something like 25 to 30 percent live birth rate, but again, exquisitely sensitive to female age. So probably somewhere between sort of 12 to 15 
percent once you're at past the age of 40 so the rates go down and past the age of 43 44 the likelihood of, of treatment success is one or two percent it's really really low wow you've been listening to the monday science podcast a weekly show bringing you the latest research and news in science technology medicine and health we hope you've gotten some useful and thought-provoking info from the show and we hope you had fun along the way we know we did we'll be back soon but in the meantime hook up with us on our website at www.mondaysciencepodcast.com shoot us an email at info at mondayssciencepodcast.com Find us on Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube at Monday Science and access episode summaries at mondayscience.medium.com. See you next week on the Monday Science Podcast.